Taiwan's presidential election is coming up, and one of the hottest topics is whether this election will affect Beijing's policy towards Taiwan, especially whether this election will bring Taiwan closer or further to war. As the election looks right now, about nine, eight or nine days out, Li Qingde is maintaining his sort of four or five point lead over Hou Yui. And if we accept for the purposes of our discussion this afternoon that Li Qingde is in fact able to secure the presidency with a small margin of, of uh, 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 by a small margin, I don't think China is going to be happy about that, no. But I do think that the Chinese already recognize that over this is the direction that this election is going. Does it move us closer to war? No, I don't think it moves us closer to war. But do you, but you think Xi Jinping is determined to take Taiwan with or without force during his tenure, at least? I think that the Communist Party is certainly committed to taking Taiwan and Xi Jinping has certainly attached his time in office uh, to, to that goal and objective. He does hedge a little bit. China's economy is not in good shape, and uh, Xi Jinping's authority is slipping. People in the Chinese military have told me that this shakeup has postponed the, any type of any D-Day type of attack uh, for at least five to eight years. So, how do you rate uh, Beijing's situation right now? And does the current political environment in Beijing? imply that a blockade or other type of uh, uh, method is uh, is uh, more likely. For example, the so-called peaceful unification uh, through the United Front tactic. U.S. Taiwan Business Council President Robert Hammond Chambers breaks down the key issues surrounding this election and the situation in the Taiwan Strait on the eve of this historic event. Thank you, Mr. Chambers, for joining Zoom in today. It's my pleasure, Simone. It's very nice to speak with you again. OK, let's talk about Taiwan. Um, Taiwan's presidential election is coming up. And one of the hottest topics is whether this election will affect Beijing's policy towards Taiwan, especially whether this election will bring Taiwan closer or further to war. Uh, most analysts believe that Beijing has its favorite candidate and uh, they want the Taiwanese people to think that if Taiwan elects the wrong person, war is unavoidable. But I want to know if that's really the case or is it just Beijing's bluff? Will the election of a certain candidate really change Beijing's plan for Taiwan? It's a great question, Simone. Obviously, the uh, obviously Beijing has a long-standing relationship. Uh, obviously, in the time of the civil war, it was a a, a, a kinetic relationship, and now um, but more on the political level with the Guomindang, the nationalists on Taiwan, and their candidate Hou Yui and his uh, quite outspoken vice presidential candidate Zhao have spoken about the importance and necessity to engage China if Hou Yui is elected president. On the DPP side, we have Lai Qingde. The Beige, Beijing has been extremely outspoken in respect to how they feel about Lai Qingde, who they accuse of being a troublemaker and a, a closet independence uh, um, advocate, uh, or maybe not a closet independence advocate, maybe just an outright independence advocate, but nevertheless, somebody that they see as problematic in respect to in, engagement across the Taiwan Strait. As the election looks right now, about Nine, eight or nine days out, Li Qingde is maintaining his sort of four or five point lead over Hou Yui. And if we accept for the purposes of our discussion this afternoon that Li Qingde is in fact able to secure the presidency with a small margin of, of uh, 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 by a small margin, I don't think China is going to be happy about that. No, but I do think that the Chinese already recognize that over this is the direction that this election is going. Does it move us closer to war? No, I don't think it moves us closer to war. I think the Chinese have a strategy and an approach of which the military coercive angle is an important part. 
but it is so, certainly not the only part, Simone, as you know. And I believe that the Chinese are going to continue to inject some patience because in the end, they believe they can absorb Taiwan without the high level of risk involved in a kinetic attack on the island. Hmm. Okay, that's very important. But do you, but you think Xi Jinping is determined to take Taiwan with or without force during his tenure, at least? I think that the Communist Party is certainly committed to taking Taiwan, and Xi Jinping has certainly attached his time in office uh, to to that goal and objective. He does hedge a little bit. I mean, he sometimes he talks about making progress on uh, Taiwan becoming part of the People's Republic of China. Sometimes he's more specific about uh, um, what the Chinese government or the Communist Party would call reunification. I think for your listeners are, are well versed and understand that the People's Republic of China has never controlled Taiwan, so it is not reunification. If the two were to absorb, if China was, to, if Taiwan was to become part of China, it would be unification, of course. But yes, Xi Jinping is certainly focused on that. We don't know how long he will be in charge of China, but he certainly seems to be looking at all different options that he possibly can to pressure the island militarily politically, culturally, to move it closer to Beijing's grasp. I know in the spring of 2022, the U.S. Taiwan Business Council wrote to the U.S. State Department uh, to express concern about narrow nature of U.S. material support, uh, which is focused on a D-Day style attack and the so-called uh, asymmetrical approach in response. At the time, the council was one of the few voices to raise concerns about the narrowness of this approach and the need to consider a blockade and gray zone activities. And now it appears that this limits on U.S. material support to Taiwan are moving. So I think the broadening of the approach is right on target and extremely important. So good job. Um, and uh, based on your assessment, what are the probability levels for different uh, scenarios, you know, ranging from a D-Day style attack to gray zone or a blockade uh, if China actually uses force? Yeah. Again, it's an, it's an important question to ask, isn't it, Simone? Mm -hmm. I, I think the, 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 the action of last resort for the Chinese Communist Party, Simone, is, an, is a full-scale D-Day style attack because the risks are so high. It isn't just about defeat. I mean, even if there were a stalemate in the Taiwan Strait, I think it, it's an, a near certainty that the US and Japan would be Im immediately involved in the, in the battle. So, Taiwan, so China would be fighting Taiwan, Japan, and the United States, probably with uh, support from the Australians, the British, and maybe some other countries around the world too. But, but I, I think quickly we would be we're dealing with a situation like that. But I think the possibility of a kinetic attack to resolve the differences between Beijing and Taipei is, let's say, less than 10%. Mm. And, and for me, that's pretty much close to zero at the moment, over the next, let's say, three to five years. Well, I think we, 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 we can possibly see, though, if there is an uptick, the, the, the Chinese can use their military in other ways short of a kinetic conflict that would be highly problematic for, you, for the United States, Taiwan, Japan and others to deal with. And let's look at Manila, for example, and the challenges that the Filipino government is presently facing with China. The use by the Chinese of not just their fishing fleet, but their Coast Guard fleet and periodically the PLA Navy to pressure the Filipinos around the South China Sea to back off their territorial claims on islands that have long been part of Manila's orbit and the Chinese now are claiming. If we if we move that sort of approach into the Taiwan Strait, it isn't if, if the Chinese are looking for escalation and they want to involve their military or some or, or possibly their Coast Guard. It is possible that we could see the use of their Coast Guard and or possibly their Navy, but I think the Coast Guard is, is perhaps more likely to interdict Taiwan ships in the Taiwan Strait. Maybe they stop them for health and humanitarian reasons or they interdict them uh, claiming that there might be illegal cargo on board. 
but they can be disruptive and they can do it not just in waters uh, in the Taiwan Strait closer to the to China's coast, but they could start stopping ships closer to the Taiwan coast, creating real challenges for how, how the Taiwan government would necessarily respond to that. Do, does the Taiwan Navy get involved? Does the US Navy and the Japanese Navy get involved? That's the first piece. And then the second piece, Simone, is let's take a look at what's happening in the Red Sea at the moment with um, the attacks on shipping that are going are, are coming in and out of um, the Middle East or are, or are coming through the Suez Canal around and then heading towards Asia. What we're seeing is disruption to shipping. We are seeing shipping routes move much further south. Insurance rates are spiking significantly. And you've got a significant uptick in uh, a naval presence by uh, forces like the United States, France, the United Kingdom and others. So you, you can move. And, and that, of course, creates disruption to supply chains. And of course, it, it creates significant increases in cost to supply chains. So I like the question about a kinetic attack. But I think if we're talking about escalation, there are a number of steps that the Chinese could potentially take that would be very difficult for us to counter. One more thought for you, because I like what you raised about, and I appreciate your kindness in respect to uh, the US Taiwan Business Council's concerns over the Biden administration's so-called asymmetric approach. If uh, force modernization and support for Taiwan's military is simply about munitions and life cycle support for legacy weapons, what that does not do, as you noted kindly, is, is it does not address gray zone or potential disruption in interdicting ships or closing down ports. Taiwan needs different types of equipment, including larger ships, including aircraft that can refuel their fighter fleet in the air. And these, the, 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 at the moment anyway, there seems to be no real appetite to help them procure those platforms and systems to deal with other scenarios. Hmm. Okay. That doesn't sound good. I mean, although your uh, the U.S. Uh, Taiwan Business Council has raised these concerns, and it seems like the needle is moving, but I mean, just how far is it from you know actually achieving the goal? I mean, are they well prepared? Are they prepared enough to you know? Uh, on the on the issue of gray zone and and the issue of of um, interdiction in the Strait and so on. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot more can be done on that front. I do think that the, the Taiwan military understands the, bro the, the broad nature of the challenge. I do think they understand that because let's face it, in an, in, an, in an ongoing era of strategic ambiguity, in the end, even though the United States and even the Japanese have moved significantly closer to direct support of Taiwan militarily, politically, we are still ambiguous about whether or not we would come to Taiwan's aid. So the only military in the world that absolutely will be there in a fight with the Chinese is the Taiwan military. And they recognize the significance. However, they need more big ships. They need modern ships, not just ones that are transferred from the, from the US after 30 or 40 years of use. So that's about building up Taiwan's domestic defense industry. As you know, the US Taiwan Business Council plays a leading role in that er in that way to bring in companies to help them, uh, uh, um, subsystems to help them in their domestic naval building programs. They can build the hulls and then they can procure subsystems from the United States and others. That's certainly one way to go. And then what the United States itself is prepared to do uh, in respect to an adjustment in policy and so I think that the Taiwan government under Tsai Ing-wen is moving in the right direction. We've got the submarine program, the special budget for naval building that's moving forward. They're moving as quickly as reasonably possible. In the U.S., when we had the Biden administration come and talk to us at the U.S. Taiwan Business Council's Defense Industry Conference in Williamsburg last autumn, we did note an adjustment in the scope, the boundary scope of their approach to supporting Taiwan that included gray zone activities and inter interdiction in the straits, including quarantine. We, what we haven't seen yet, Simone, is uh, that, that broadening in scope manifesting itself in foreign military sales and direct support for Taiwan's military. And we'll see if we're gonna see any changes through this year because the Biden administration has been really consistent in its support, but it has also been narrow in its support. Hmm. Okay. 
I still, I mean, after listening to you, I still have some concerns. It just seems like、uh, things are moving in the、uh, right direction, but I just don't know. Like、uh, we're now betting on Xi Jinping is not gonna attack Taiwan <laughs> soon, but、uh, is that our hope? I mean, if Xi Jinping attacks right now,、yeah. we're not prepared. Well, I, I think we are as prepared as we can be at this juncture. I think it, it's a it's an important question. I don't think people are being dismissive of the threat that 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 and and certainly our military planners have to plan as if there's a possibility, if not a probability, that Xi Jinping might attack tomorrow. It's not zero percent, but it、yeah. is it it is at this juncture unlikely,、uh, and and as I as I noted earlier on. So I think I think we we do have there is some time. The issue is how much time and to what extent the U.S. can forward deploy its own forces, reorganize the Marine Corps, as as we have seen taking place. General Rudder was with us last summer in、um, uh, in in Taiwan, talking a wee bit about that as well. So forward deployed U.S. forces. We've got significant force modernization and and a significant growth in the Japanese defense budget that's coming down the line. And then what's happening in Taiwan? From a, a year-on-year standpoint, in the growth of their defence budget, there is serious effort to deter、mm. Xi Jinping from using his military.、Mm. That's good. What What is your advice to the Taiwanese people, and also the Ta- Taiwanese government? You talked about the Taiwanese government, but just in general, what is your advice to to the people? Well, I think the, my advice to the Taiwan Taiwan people is is I mean, and I, I, I say this with all due respect, it's their sovereignty that they are protecting, but national security sovereignty starts with national security and the ability to de- to deter threats. So supporting Taiwan's military should be an an important priority for every citizen on the island who believes that Taiwan has sovereignty and and should be allowed to determine its own future. So that's the. That's the first piece. The second piece is that that after the after the general election, obviously,、um, we're going to have a change in president. That's for sure, and we're, we're probably going to have a change in the makeup of the Li Fa Yuan as well, and that's going to create a new dynamic for support of the Ministry of National Defence, as well as a, a new dynamic in respect to the relationship between the United States and Taiwan. Continuity will be enormously important. In ensuring that the U.S. and Japan are hap- oh, happy is the wrong word, but the U.S. and Japan are comfortable with the new government in charge and the seriousness with which it will approach the defence of the island, and that seriousness at its core has to be Taiwan defence spending, training, and support for Taiwan's Ministry of National Defence. Hmm. Okay. I heard.、Um... There's a possibility that if Lai Qingde is elected,、um, Li Fa Yuan, the、uh, what's that, that Congress,、um, might not be the same party. If that happens, would that be a a hurdle to what's going to happen?、Next? It's it, Simone. Great question. It's a it's a complicating factor for sure. The last time that we had a DPP president and a Guomindang. Run legislature was during the era of Chen Shui-bian, and it was a very difficult period、uh, as Chen tried to、um, procure weapons from the United States, grow the defense budget. The KMT obstructed almost every effort that Chen Shui-bian made, certainly between 2003 and 2006, causing significant tensions in Taiwan-U.S. relations.、Uh, and you know, we, we are looking at the prospect. Of the the Guomindang running the Li Fa Yuan and and Lai Qingde and the DPP in the in the legislative office, I think that the overall dynamic has changed in respect to the threat from China, and certainly Hou Yui, Kou Enzhe, and Lai Qingde have all talked about the importance of defence spending, continued growth in defence spending. But the Guomindang, like、uh, any of the major parties in Taiwan, is made up of different factions. So I think what we will be looking very closely at is if if the Li Fa Yuan is in fact controlled by the Pan Blue, maybe Pan Blue Pan White coalition,、um, how will it prioritize defense spending first and foremost, and then how will it, how will it cooperate with Lai Qingde and the Yuan, the Executive Yuan, in putting together a, a budget for 2025 and beyond、uh, that will.、Um, 
will will meet Taiwan's national security needs and satisfy the United States and Japan that Taiwan Taiwan is taking its defense seriously. Hmm. Okay. Um, next, let's talk about China. China's economy is not in good shape, and uh, Xi Jinping's authority is slipping. This is evidenced by the fact that his policies are no longer effective, and the Chinese people are voting with their feet and with their money. Moreover, the recent uh, shakeup in the Chinese military leadership has greatly weakened the PLA's ability to attack Taiwan. People in the Chinese military have told me that this shakeup has postponed the any type of any D-Day type of attack uh, for at least five to eight years. So, how do you rate uh, Beijing's situation right now? And does the current political environment in Beijing imply that a blockade or other type of a uh, uh, method is uh, more likely? For example, the so-called peaceful unification uh, through the United Front tactic. Yeah. So I think there are there are there are two possible two possible scenarios, Simone, that raise the likelihood of kinetic conflict between Taiwan and China, and then drawing in the United States and Japan. The first is an accident, like the two thousand and one accident that the the uh, Hainan situation, where the U.S. Navy airplane was clipped by a Taiwan a Chinese fighter and crash landed on Hainan Island, and there was a 10 day to two week crisis between the US and China. A situation like that involving the Chinese Air Force or the Chinese Navy could get out of hand quickly. And that it's hard to predict where that would end up. That's scenario number one. But I think it still remains relatively unlikely, but it's not zero. The other scenario, though, is, is what's going on in China and the degree to which Xi Jinping actually is fully in charge, where his vulnerabilities are not just in uh, his vulnerabilities in respect to control, but his vulnerabilities from a macro standpoint, institutionally, for example, his control over the military, or economically, for example, the debt burden that's held by property companies and the potential yeah. economic impact that that might have more broadly on the Chinese economy that could create events within China that could threaten Chinese Communist Party rule. If we get to a point, that point, where the Communist Party and its leadership, of which Xi Jinping is the most recognizable face, then I think, again, we are looking at a possibility that the Chinese look at some ex, uh, external crisis to mm. mobilize and to unify the Chinese people around something taking place outside of China. And the most obvious scenario is Taiwan. So I think those those two are those two instances are unpredictable. And on that latter instance, I think that sort of hits your point about what we're seeing, even though it can be difficult, coming out of China at the moment. Right, right. I mean, the Chinese domestic political environment um, is, uh, this is a very, very complicated question because you can kind of argue from both sides. I mean, uh, some people say, you know, um, their economy is so bad, you cannot afford to fight a war. Xi Jinping has so much other things, to, so many other things to worry about. But on the other hand, you can argue that if they are in a desperate situation, they need external forces or reasons to let people not focus on their domestic problem. Yes. So I just don't know which one would, would it be. Yeah. I mean, again, we're dealing in hypotheticals, of course. It's, it's, it's incredibly hard to predict. I mean, you know, conversely, Economically, you know, they're, they're sitting on uh, extraordinary sums of money in their in their um, uh, currency reserves. Um, they do have um, they have a, a very large domestic market that consumes a great deal and creates wealth. And they remain, even though countries around the world led by the United States are attempting to de-risk vulnerabilities that have their roots in China, primarily the production of other people's technology, but many supply chains uh, start in China as they uh, as, as they um, um, uh, produce and then export to, to around the world. That that isn't going to change the centrality of that. So China's ability to continue to create wealth is it should, in my opinion, continue to create a degree of economic stability within within the country. But mm. again, it's like a seesaw, isn't it? 
we we just do, because it's hard to really see in. We just don't know the extent to which that economic strength can offset pr primarily the debt issue. But that's not the only economic problem that they've got. But the debt issue uh, offset the dis debt issue to the extent that it continues to provide ongoing stability to the state and as a consequence to Chinese Communist Party rule. Exactly. Just we just don't know. We, we just know. don't know. That's right. Okay, uh, Mr. Chambers, these are all my questions. Do you have anything else to add? Simone, it's just a pleasure to chat with you again. I really appreciate this afternoon's conversation. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure.